Okay. So, Elizabeth, is that showing up? It is. Okay. Shall we start? Yep. Okay. doke. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming today. This uh, snowy day, so I think that's going to be the norm now from now on. The abnormal days will be the days that it doesn't snow and it's above freezing. <laughs> so, you know, welcome to Minnesota in central Pennsylvania. So, uh, the title of this presentation is This Ain't Your Daddy's Text Adventure, and I was hoping that would be a controversial enough title that it might draw some people to just come for what the heck. Um, but we're going to talk about interactive fiction today. And rather than me explain what interactive fiction is, I will in a minute, I've decided a, a, a physics professor would really make the most sense. So <laughs> I'm going to Sheldon. ask Sheldon to explain it to us, Sheldon Cooper from the Big Bang Theory. Ooh, I'm going to stop it. Ha! Ah, because I want to put, for, for those of you that are online, um, if you look in the chat pod, I put the links to these videos in case they don't show up for you or you can't hear the audio. Um, it's debatable what will happen here when you show a movie through Adobe Connect. I thought that was just that was just a gem that's worth sharing. Sheldon always I find all sorts of good stuff from the Big Bang Theory on different things the EGC works on. There was one on reciprocity that he went through <laughs> and thought was absolutely hilarious. So anyway, so you kind of get an idea what what text-based adventures or what they call now interactive fiction uh, is. Um, it really is a series of areas of rooms that you can move about in and manipulate objects all by typing commands in. Uh, that's the pure version that came out really in the, in the 70s and in the 80s. Um, usually type a verb followed by a noun, like move chair, take chair. Um, pick up chair probably wouldn't work because it would be too many words. Um, they used to call those... Um, they, they would call them the interpreter, where you type was the parser and all that kind of stuff. Um, and and the, the if purists today still believe that text-based adventures should be just text-based. No images, no nothing else. Um, you usually have an inventory, which is a place where you store your objects, and that and sometimes they'll refer to it as a backpack or whatever. And inventories can be infinite, they can be finite in terms of weight or objects you can carry or so on and so forth, it varies from adventure to adventure. And then finally, you can save and restore your game usually. You can save it, and some of them will let you save it in multiple quick spots. Some will just let you save it where you are, and you pick up and you come back. So that's pretty much what, what an interactive fiction game is. Um, like Sheldon said, it runs off your imagination for the most part. That's what you're, you're basing it on. So, um, so here's a brief history. Um, Many people credit uh, what was called Adventure or Advent, and it was called Advent because it was the number of characters they could actually use to name the file. Um, and it was later called Colossal Cave. <clears throat> so you'll hear references to Colossal Cave all over, and there's tons and tons of versions. I have one here. Um, it, was, it was written by Will Crowther around 1975, and he wrote it because he was going through a divorce, and he wanted a way to connect with his children. So he was highly motivated, which I thought, think is kind of interesting. 
Um, but in it, you go in, you explore a cave, you fight monsters, you solve puzzles. It's, that's pretty typical of what, what all ifs became. Um, so what happened in the late 70s to the middle 80s? A large number of interactive fictions appear. Some of them were on mainframe, some of them were on the then new uh, IBM PC Juniors and, and you know, the, the Apple IIs and so on. Um, the most famous one, as far as companies go, that produced a number of this was named Infocom. And Infocom existed, um, I think, like from 1982 or something to 1989 or something like that. It had many if titles in court, in, you know, including the famous Zork series. So if you're, if you're interested in that and you look at uh, interactive fiction, you'll always find references to Zork and Z interpreters that were kind of things that understood the, the language that they used for, to create the Zork series and so on and so forth. Um, fascinating, extremely involved, you know, uh, dozens of hours of gameplay time, just like we have in some games today, but all text-based. Everything's text-based. Um, so interest kind of started to decline around, like, I'm going to say, like 1987, 88. Uh, you know, Infocom went out of business because they just couldn't sell titles anymore. Um, and, and primarily because about that time, you started seeing games that were primarily text-based but had a graphic image. That's how it started. And then there was more involved in their animations, and then there were graphic scenes that you could click on. And so on and so forth. And that's how we end up where we are today with these, you know, fully immersive things. They all started from interactive fiction. Hmm. Um, the interest in ifs is steadily rising. Never died completely. There were always a certain core group of people that wanted to do this, but the tools just simply didn't exist for a large number of people to create them. You really had to know programming, at least basic programming, to create an if. Um, so that cut the numbers down drastically. But there are some tools out there today that will let you create if they, they range from free to very cheap. Um, they range from very simple to very complex in terms of programming, um, and so on and so forth. We'll take a look at some of those, but I thought what would be really cool here is if we could just go play Colossal Cave for a minute or two. Um, you can see here's the sample code um, that was used to create it. Um, very, very, um, um, very, very program programmer speak. Mm -hmm. if you want to call it that? You know, most people are, would look at that. And say, I don't even know what that means. Um, you can see that he used the dreaded go to, which you're never supposed to use in programming language because it produces what they call spaghetti code. And of course, the the corollary to the go to was the come from command that ne never never caught on. So. Oh, that, that's that's a joke for programmers. So, <laughs> um, so I thought we could go out and you see if I can pull it up here. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I can make it any. I don't think I can make the text any bigger or anything like that. So that's what it is. It looks pretty ugly. So, we are here. Welcome to adventure. Would you like instructions? So you guys tell me what to do, and I'll type the commands in. What should I do? Yes. <laughs> okay, I will type in yes, see what happens. So there you go. So see, there are lots of reading here. Somewhere nearby is Colossal Cave. Um, I should warn you that I look at the first five letters of each word. So it's a very primitive interpreter. And you can type help, um, and so on and so forth. So now down at the very end, you're standing at the end of a road before a small brick building. Around you is a forest. A small stream flows out of the building and down a gully. What do you want to do? Anyone? Sure. See, choices, choices, choices. Enter building. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what happens. Hey. You're inside, and that's one of the things that a lot of people find very frustrating about interactive fiction. Sometimes you'll type a command like that that sounds perfectly logical, and it just won't work. And you're like, why won't it work? I, I played one recently. Um, it was written recently, and you had to plug a, a VCR into, into a wall socket. It took me 10 minutes to figure out how to get the verbiage right so it would work. It was just very frustrating. Okay, so we're inside the building. There's some keys. There's a shiny brass lamp nearby. There's food, there is food here, and there's a bottle of water. Take all. Okay, let's try that. 
you have some experience. I <laughs> Lately. Mm. I was curious about that. Yeah. You got to, got to want to try to get all. Okay. It doesn't know all at all. Okay. Nope. Uh, get keys. One at a time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> get, get lamp. Lamp. Okay. Don't get crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I actually played a first first text based adventure mm-hmm. game I ever played was called Mansion, mm-hmm. and it was on an HP three thousand mini frame computer. And if you typed go crazy, it would take you to the crazy cottage in the woods. <laughs> oh. Eat food. Get water. Okay. So now I want to try something. See if this one's missing. X Y Z Z Y. Let's see if that's in there. What is that? Poof. (laughs) If you proceed, you will likely. That is a that is kind of like a famous Easter egg that I think started here, and in a lot of the early text-based adventure games, sometimes it wouldn't do anything. Sometimes. It will teleport you. I'm guessing we were just teleported somewhere. No, it's dark. It's just dark. Pitch dark. Can you say light lamp? Yeah, use lamp. So I screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. No, there's a screw up here. Get wand. See if that <laughs> Get rod. Okay, so at this point I'm going to tell you, let's see if I works for inventory. Nope. Let's see if I and V works. Nope, it must want, must want the whole thing. <coughs> so that shows what we're carrying so far. <laughs> I'm now I'm curious if you type in X Y Z Z Y again, what's going to happen? Okay. <laughs> Push it a little bit. Oh, You're inside. Exactly. How about that? <laughs> Very cool. Take the rusty Ooh. star. <laughs> yeah, we did. Rod. We got the rod. Oh, rod with a rusty star. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought they were two different things. Okay. So, what do you want to do now? Put the black rod in the of the star. Can we look around? That's what you're saying. Just ruin the whole image. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to give these to our people on a description. We're inside a building and have a little house for a large spring. So here's something else you can try. And this was very common in early, okay, not in this one. But sometimes you could you could type, after you've been places dozens of times, you don't want to read that whole description, yeah. you could type terse. And it would give you a short description, and if you want to go back, you could take verbose, and it would give you the original long description, uh-huh. too. Cool. So there's all sorts of commands there, and I don't know whether if we typed in help, whether that would tell us all I mean, that stuff or not. We go west. Okay, we're in front of them. Yeah. Don't go west again. Okay. Let's try just W and see if that works. Yeah. So this brings up another really good point. Maps are critical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I remember when I played in the eighties, I was always drawn. And what yep. really was frustrating is when, like, you would go west, but the game would actually take you west and then curve you north. Uh-huh. It wouldn't tell you that, and uh-huh. so you'd be trying to. Well, wait, I just. Back. But now I'm northwest of where I would not. But some would do that, but some wouldn't. So. Uh-huh. Then you got to the point where you didn't even need the map anymore. It was all up in your yep. head. Yep, yep. It was all up in that graphic Apple chip. Graphic chip. <laughs> That's right. It was all in that memos. Okay, so you guys get the idea. We don't have to keep playing playing this one, but this is. This is free. You can go online and pull this down. I mean, it runs on the map. Uh, There's now, dozens of variations of this. I do have a question. I'm assuming that somewhere there's a quest that we have to discover and complete. Is that true? I think in this one there's a bunch of... I don't know if there's any major quests or not. It's just a bunch of sub-quests. So um, in, the other, in some of the other ones, there were definitely major quests. You know, you know Zork, there was 
um, you know, basically trying to figure out how to get out. <laughs> so it's a quest. You know, you're stuck here. And then there were there were sub quests like Zork had this um, excuse me had this thief that would come and steal your stuff, and you had to track them down through the maze. And this, so if you ever hear this phrase, you're in a maze of twisty passages all alike, that came out of, I think it came out of here, and then Zork used it. And a lot of places use that, because they'll set you in this maze that's actually randomized. And so it doesn't matter what direction you go, you get stuck until you kind of figure it out. So Zork's wasn't truly randomized, but it also had up and down. So... And what a lot of people would do is they build up huge inventories and they start dropping things in every location, so they could so you could figure out where you were. So, so if you're ever lost in a cave, you'll, you guys can survive now because you know. <laughs> so anyway, that's adventure. Uh, awful fun stuff. Like I said, it is available online. It's available for the Mac or the PC. There's dozens of variations of it. I think that one I have is pretty. Sticks pretty true to the core original one. Um, so, am I still showing up, Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay. So, oh, let's keep going. So, uh, here's a couple of if editors that are currently in existence. Um, Textadventures.com. Actually, I'm not sure that's the right one, but it might be Textadventures.co. Um, we'll go there in a second, so we can, we can make sure that's right. That's one I used recently to build uh, something I'm going to show you. Um, it has both a web-based editor and it has a PC editor. I found the web-based editor a little flaky, but it worked. I think it has to do with the fact that it's just browser-based. The PC editor seems fairly robust. It's fairly easy to use, and the adventures that you produce with it can be played through a browser, which is nice. Most of the if games out there are not browser-based, and so you need to download what's called an interpreter, and I'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, <clears throat> another one that produces fairly decent games, and it's pretty cool, is called Twine. Um, and Twine is based off of technology that came out, oh, probably 15 years ago, called TiddlyWiki. So I don't know if any of you ever heard of that, but TiddlyWiki came out, and it was all... Uh, JavaScript and it was basically it gave you the ability to create a wiki offline and then upload it. So it was all like one big web page that had all this hidden stuff in it. Um, you couldn't edit the stuff live. It had, you had to you had to edit your source offline and upload. So every time you change, you had to re-upload, re-upload. Um, so of course it got eclipsed by online editors very quickly, but it still exists. Um, and it's interesting code. Um, so, Axma is very, very much like Twine. In fact, I would call it a fork of the Twine code that occurred not too long ago. Um, but the guy that runs Axma is selling a professional version and some add-ons that give you some, some different abilities. So how well that will take off or not, I don't know. Uh, both have fairly well-supported communities. Uh, as does Text Adventures, has a well-supported user community. You can go and ask questions and so on. Um, TAD's Text Adventure Development System well, has been around for a while, Adrift, and Inform. I'm going to show you some screenshots of all these, so I'm going to get too far ahead. Um, TAD's is not web-based. Adrift is not web-based. Inform is not, but can be with the addition of this thing called Parchment. That is kind of an add-on to it that will, that, that will actually interpret and throw it up on a web page. So, text adventures, I'm still saying it's .com, so maybe it is, but we're going to go there for a second. So we're going to go there and we're going to play EDC Paper Chase 2.0, just for a few minutes. So let's switch over here, switch over here. Yes, textadventures.co.uk. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so let's play this online. And I'm not logged in, so I'm going to just play it without being able to save the game. So that you can kind of see. So this is a revamp of something that the EGC produced a number of years ago and didn't age well. So this is the second version. It's greatly simplified um, and actually introduces you to ifs <coughs> and so on. So if you ever want to play it, you can, you can go to techadventures.co.uk and look for EGC Paper Chase and play it. 
Um, hopefully it'll be up on the EDC site in, not too, in the not too distant future, at least the link. The thing that I like about it is it was fairly easy to put a, 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 an adventure together. It does have the option of actually showing a map as opposed to you drawing it. And you don't have to do that. So if you're a purist, you can hide the map. Um, and, but it does allow uh, like hypertext links and so on. And so you can do everything through the text, or you have these little things over here that show you your inventory and your objects and so on. So it kind of has a web-based feel to it. So we're not going to read all these, but you can see basically what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, here's what ifs are. You should go to the north. And now I'm in what's called the if commands room. So there's a chair in there, there's an object, and you can go south or north. And so I'm telling the this verb noun combination. See what happens if I type take chair. Gives me a smart message. <laughs> so I don't want to really have him take the chair. I just want him to see what happens. So let's keep going north. So again, I talked about the common verbs. Um, you'll see most of those in most games, but not every game. And, and all games have unique things in, in them. And sometimes they'll tell you up front. Sometimes you have to figure it out. Uh, and that's half of the fun of text adventure games, is sometimes figuring out that keyword to type in. But it can be very frustrating. So let's keep going. So now I'm in an inventory room. I'm talking about inventory. And I can say things like take book. And I have the book. So now I can try to read it. <laughs> so, and now you can see up here my inventory has appeared there, and I can actually click on it as well. So if I wanted to do it through this type of a command, I could. Don't have to. Um, so I'll keep going north. I can use the compass to go north and south. And this is kind of nice because this shows me what's available in terms of directions. Um, so you could do just the compass and not show the map, or you could show both like I did, or neither. Um, so I'm telling them, okay, you're about to enter the actual true adventure. Here we go. So now we're in the ultimate technology room. And your goal is to discover the ultimate technology. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to go around and check out the offices and see what's going on. Um, you're in the room. There's a computer there. It's looking for a password. So let's try use computer. See what happens. And it's just telling me you got to find the password. So at this point, I'm kind of guessing we need to find the password. So again, what should I do? I'm opening it up to you guys. Let's go eat. Okay. So now I'm in the supply room. There's a paper shredder, a mutilated scrap of paper. Um, what should I do now? Get paper? Find jammer. <laughs> okay. So I don't understand that. What else should I try? You said take paper. Get paper, yeah. Take paper. Well, get a work. Let's try that. Which paper you mean? Hmm. I two. <clears throat> yeah. So we have something that's got some letters on it. Okay. Anything else you want to do here? Can you get the other paper out of the shredder? Okay. Give me something to type. Get, get paper. We tried that, but. That was type one. Okay. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> can you get the can you get the whole paper shredder? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can tell I have a sense of humor, <laughs> somewhat. Okay. Should we go west? <laughs> or, yeah. or, okay. So now we're back in the ultimate education technology room. And it looks like I can go north. Use the computer. Okay, let's try that. Nope, still don't have a password. 
type an EE do you see? Okay, so EE do you see? Don't understand. Could you type EE do you see? Nope. <laughs> Northward. Okay, let's go north. So I'm now in the hallway. Security poster, okay, there's a spindle scrap of paper, and I can go north, south, or west. Use the security poster. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to tell you probably examine. I examine. Go, go back south. Okay. Can you enter password? That? No. Shit, what was that first one? Well, you want to look out? <clears throat> so let's look at that one. There's that one, and I see something I need. Oh, combine the two. <laughs> okay. So, how do you want me to combine them? Use the black rod. <laughs> <laughs> Use black rod. I can't see that. <laughs> Can we use the computer? Computer. That's a password. Mm -hmm. Inventory. How do we enter the password? Wasn't there another scrap of paper in the north room? Got no? it. Oh, I thought there were. Let's go back north. Yeah. 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 I thought that there were yeah. two in that room. Yeah. It shows that there. Yeah, because yeah. it said you could either get the mutilated piece or. Yeah, I've got to fix that. That should be something I got to fix because you already have that. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Help me, Brett. Troubleshooting here. Or you can go north or west. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's a folded scrap of paper. Get paper. <laughs> yeah, that's going to do something with that. I like that. That should, uh, that should not be showing you pieces you already have. Oh, look at that. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, you couldn't have figured. You didn't buy any vowels, Rodney. That's the password. So. Bath so, is pristine. That cracks me up. <laughs> so. Detail. Where do we go now? Well, how do we go back to the computer? Okay. So. So chances are you still don't have what you need. You have that. You have that. You have that. Oh, uh, so it's like we're missing that E. There's two E's with me. Yeah. So you just have to go back and look. Oh. So there's probably a front part. Can see. It could be. Keep going north. Okay, so we'll go north. Okay. We need to find the disregarded scrap of paper. <laughs> An empty robot. <laughs> Examine robot. Ooh, hot for Ask robot. Question? I'll take to robot. T A L K. Talk. Robot. Go for it. I love it. Uh, yeah. 
So now what do we do? Go south. I think first we should apologize to the robot. The robot. For not you know what happens when you activate the robot? I've never seen a movie that turns out well. <laughs> okay. So now we're back. Type password? Whatever that was, yeah. No. Type password? Type the words, Laura. Yeah. Can you just use computer? Or Let's try that. Oh, oh look at that. Duh. <laughs> okay. There you go. That's so strange. So. Yeah, it's people. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Charlton Heston runs by. <laughs> so, just a little cutesy game that uh, hopefully engaging. Yeah, cool. yeah. It, it, it was it was fun to put together. Good um, to do that as a group, right? <laughs> sure, I think so. Why not? So, Brett, so, one of the questions I have for you. I mean, how establishing that kind of the the taxonomy norms, I guess, that you use in that? Like, how, how do you go about articulating that to people? Because it seems like this could be really valuable if you have someone either play it or maybe even better is create something on their own. Oh, yeah. It takes a lot of thought and planning yeah. uh, for whatever it is you're trying to explain. But how do you establish kind of what the, the standards are? I'm not quite sure I understand your question. The standards in terms of like what goes into a, a, an interactive fiction game? Or right, like, so like a lot of the commands you'd use, you know, someone would say like, ask the robot this or something, and it was, well, got to go with talk. Really good um, games will take all those. Okay. And it'll, it'll take ask or talk or, you know, buddy up to or, or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I just never got there with this particular one. Right. It's, it's a little bit stricter. But... So you have the, the flexibility to define. You do have the flexibility okay. to define that. I ran into some issues with this editor that had me scratching my head. I was like, this is probably good enough, even though it's not perfect. Um, and I can keep banging away on it, trying to trying to add in the, it's kind of like or statements, except this or this or this or this or this. Yeah. And I wrote, wrote it wasn't quite there yet. But okay. it seems to accommodate that. And some of the people that, that write in this a lot, there's, there's a game out, again, called Mansion, um, it seems to, in some cases you did a really good job with that. You can type almost anything in all of a sudden. In other cases you're like, oh my god, you know, I'm typing, I'm typing, it's just not accepting any of my right. commands. So, and that to me remains one of the real sticking points with playing this. Uh, you can get stuck really easy, and sometimes just a simple word you haven't thought of. So, um, so, Here's Twine and Axma. They both pretty much look the same. They let you build these little squares and their rooms, and then when you build the links between them. Um, now, the weird thing about both of those is they don't allow you to type in any commands. It's all it's all based in, so you have to build all the choices into the actual text that appears and, and make them links so you can click on them. Uh, the other thing that neither one of this does very well to is allow you to actually have an inventory. There's a way to kind of fake an inventory, and Axma actually has an add-on you can buy that will give you an inventory like commands. So take that with a grain of salt. It's very easy to put a twine game together. It really is. Um, right. You said these blue boxes represent room. They were, well, is in it, some it, cases. Okay. That, that's actually where I'm going. Is it also possible to visualize the boxes as chapters, so it'd be more like a choose-your-own-adventure structure you, you, rather than interactive. You, you could. Mapping out. You could. You can't have, like, folders. Like, you can't have a room or a square there expand into a whole bunch of other squares, you know, like like files within folders or folders within folders. It would have to be directed yeah. to a certain yeah. place. And so you can imagine, if this gets really complicated, it gets very complicated visually. Like look at look over there to the left. Right. You have those, you know, there's stuff <clears> in between everything. Then the other thing that's a little bit confusing about it is those two boxes in the lower left. So the story title is a reserved keyword for the, for the title of the box. Um, and style sheet actually lets you go in and just as you can with style sheets on the web, 
lets you adjust the style sheet for how your your adventure appears. Um, so that's kind of weird that they did it that way. Um, but anyway, I've played around with that. I actually tried doing the, the paper chase through this interface, and I could have done it, but without the command line interface, I didn't think it was really doing proper homage to, to the original text-based adventures that like type stuff in. Um, so that's playing maximum. Then we have CAD. CAD has been around a long time since the 90s, and there's a couple different flavors of it. I will warn you this, if you're looking at CAD, you'll come across something called HTML tabs, and you'll think, oh, that runs on the web. No, that just lets you use HTML commands inside the tabs interface mm -hmm. to format your, your text. So I found that kind of a misnomer. But mm -hmm. this kind of shows you the, the what the language looks like. It's very like C. That is like kind C. of an interesting idea, though, I'm imagining for like a, an IS250 kind of course, right, where you could integrate elements of the things that you're learning with oh, yeah. actually building out a story, too. Yeah. So. Yeah, it would, be, it would be cool for any like any kind of program. This could be something they did for extra credit or on the side, or um, to, it, it's it's C like hmm. when you look at that. And if you learn if you learn C, if you learn some different flavors of it. It's not too hard to switch between C and um, you know C plus plus and some other things. So um, I never actually tried doing a TADS game, but there's some very good TADS. There's some very good adventure games out there that were built on tabs that are extremely complex. It's a very robust language. Um, it is a Windows editor. Like I said, it's code-based. And you do need a local interpreter to run it on Windows and Macs. So it's basically a programming download. A Drift is another one that's out there. Adventure Developer and Runner slash dash interactive fiction toolkit. Um, there are Windows and Mac editors. Again, it's code-based, kind of. But if you look at this interface, you can see on the left there, it uses folders for different things like objects and rooms and things like that. And then once you're in a particular area, you can see um, you can like so like the objects box that's there, kind of off to the middle left area there. You can have have things in there like a door, a ticket, and so on. So you can kind of store your stuff in there. It's more visual than just code but it's still a little bit difficult to use, maybe. It depends on who you are. Um, and I'm so guessing here, with the uh, map at the top, the red and the green dots, so those indicate you can freely go into an area and red would be you have to do something. I think that's what it is. They're locked. It's like locked okay. doors, and you've got to unlock them. Doors and keys okay. is a metaphor. All right. So um, then here's Inform, and the ETC Paper Chase, the first one was built in Inform, and Inform's really radically different. Um, Inform lets you type in natural phrases, and it builds the game for you based on what you type. So if you look at this, um, Foyer of the Opera House is a room. Once you type that and you save it, it creates a room for you called the Foyer of the Opera House. Um, then there's the... There's the um, the description that follows it, and you type, if you go north in the foyer, say, try to go north in the foyer, says, you've only just arrived, which basically means you can't go that way. So you're not actually doing any code or any of that kind of stuff. You don't have to with Inform. It just lets you type in these natural commands, and it builds it for you. Um, so it's interesting uh, to a point. I know that um, um, Jason Wolf. Um, who, by the way, Wolf 1000 was named after him. He's the one that originally coded the first one. He used this, and he, he really liked it. Um, but then again, he was a hardcore programmer, too. So, um, And like I said, this will run on the web with the thing called the Parchment Edition, which is a you know, just a little chunk of code that just takes what, what informs a couple other uh, editors' output and puts it up on the web for you. And by Kenner on the web, you mean the output? The output runs on the web. You cannot edit it on the web. You're editing it through, a, through an editor. And I really hesitated to throw this in, but this is so cool. Um, <laughs> it, so RenPy is, they call it a visual novel engine. And I'm going to take you out again to, a, to another YouTube video. So those of you that are remote, that would be that second link. Um, and in case it doesn't show up for you here. But this is really cool. So I'll show you this one. Okay. What? So this is test number three. Uh, 
Um, haven't changed the backgrounds yet, but I have done the artwork for the um, main wolf character, Botol. So there we go. So this basically lets you create interactive stories, digital storytelling. That's what this thing is all about. Most of it is, you know, find there, because it came out of Japan, it uses Japanese anime characters and so on, and it's stories about boys and girls trying to date each other. And that kind of, but this is a little different in that they used actual photos. And, <coughs> but, and she's clicking to go, go from um, text to text. already. Yeah. Text and the music. Yeah. Yeah, you get the idea. Um, and here's a little bit of what the rent again, it's coding, but it's not really coding. Um, but you have to actually go in and type this this sort of stuff to set things up. Like you're defining your characters, um, you're setting colors, and you're obviously using you know hexadecimal stuff to do it. Um, but it, I've seen some really, really good visuals. Like they say, they're really good visual novels. And you can have some branching. Um, there's all sorts of um, different, there's a lot of features in, in the editors themselves. I um, mean, some of you saw there where they made the screen shake and that kind of stuff. So this isn't really interactive fiction, not really, but, but it is really neat and it has some really good potential. Uh, there's editors out there for the Mac, for the PC, it's for use. Um, it has a very good following. Um, you can there's good support from user communities when you get stuck with something. There's all sorts of stuff up on YouTube with videos of how to do things and so on and so forth. So Rempi is cool. Um, I mentioned you need you need interpreters for to play most of these things. Um, basically, an interpreter is a program you download and install, and usually these interpreters will um, will accommodate multiple different types of if games from multiple with multiple different code bases. Um, so there's a, you know, if you just type in if interpreters, you'll probably get that line. That'll be the first thing that comes up. Uh, so again, here's some beginner guide to ifs. Uh, Brasslander.org, if you just remember that, that's the most important thing. Um, and the if archive, ifarchive.org is a great place to go to find if games. Um, if database, if database.tads.org is another good place. But again, if you just type in if if uh, games, you're going to find a whole bunch of them. The hard thing is matching up the interpreter with the right game. They usually tell you what you need to play them. So, so I'm going to throw this up here <coughs> um, since this is supposed to be about education. Um, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to ask everyone that's here what they think about different possible uses of if in education, in higher ed specifically. Um, <coughs> I like the idea, I have to confess I like the RenPy, and it's because if you're doing some kind of language learning or some kind of even anthropology or something like that, it would be a really nice way to introduce certain artifacts like like for vocabulary, like this is a uh, uh, this is a Pepsi, and you see a bottle of Pepsi here, <laughs> something like that. That it, it would be more interesting than just a bunch of flashcards. It would be. It would, it would put it in context too, possibly in the context of the story. Right. And I, I mean, I don't know near as much as you do about language learning, but I understand that's that's considered very important. You know, you don't want to learn it in abstract. It's true of most disciplines too. So. Um, other thoughts? So, Ravi, IST. 
How could IST? You know, I was thinking, I wasn't necessarily thinking about IST, but I, there are a lot of these like scavenger kinds of games. I could see where you could maybe write one quickly that you could have students go to different parts of the course, or maybe it brings up important concepts that you're going to cover in the course, and maybe even, um, you know, for team building, like having it done as a group, because I think there was like an extra dynamic. If I were doing some of these games by myself, obviously, I would maybe go down a different path, and um, I feel like I'm more informed kind of working within the group. So that might be kind of a cool thing to do, have them like play a game by themselves and then kind of play in their group. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, anyway, that's something I was thinking about. And I also, you were talking about like the games uh, in 240. One of the things that Fred Fonseca does is he has students build a game in Java because they're learning about Java. Okay. And so I don't know like if there might be some use where they could, like at the beginning of the course, just kind of do something as an introductory activity. Mm -hmm. Build it in this, and like what are some big ideas about building a game that you can that you can include later whenever you're building things in Java. It's like a prototyping kind of strategy. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Because I don't know how much he hits on that. I think he just kind of expects, because a lot of people play games, that they'll just kind of pick those things up. Yeah, but like the big overarching concepts, like you were talking about building. Yeah, and that's, so. I mean, there's there's a there's a methodology to building the game. I mean, there's a science, but there's an art, too. And, and yeah, if you just throw somebody in and just say, make a game, yeah. I've tried that. It doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, are there best practices for storyboarding a game that you could point people to? I think there are. Um, doesn't shell games have that kind of stuff? I think so. I don't know if they use interactive fiction, but yeah, they yeah. do have a prototyping tool. But in terms of like prototyping and storyboarding, I mean, how to lay out your dialogue, that kind of stuff. I will say this, people that write dialogue for games because of the non-linear, especially the non-linear games, they're, the good ones are really in demand because there's there's not many out there that are really good at it. At least there didn't used to be. I don't know. There could, there's probably more and more as time goes by. But I mean, I know five years ago they were they said this. You know, you can do this really well. You've got a job. You know, you'll be going from company to company as a consultant, but you've got a pretty good job. I don't know if this is too abstract or not, but it almost seems like you could you could leverage this in an interesting way. If you get rid of sort of the, the geographical metaphor, like imagine an interactive surgery, right? Like you're trying to describe to someone how to do things, and you'd really have to know what you were doing if you had to do interact. You know, where do you want to cut first? What body part? What are you looking for? Um, because without the visual cues, it would really force you to know kind of like what you're doing. I mean, that might be... that. That's a great example. I've been... Other than writing, I wasn't thinking of anything else because my job isn't specifically education, it's mm -hmm. like project management. And this it was nostalgia and just curiosity that brought me here. But I have the attention span of a gnat when I have to write. Mm -hmm. And I write in snippets and use Scrivener and I write things and put a range of them in different ways on basically a storyboard on my computer. But if you do something like you said and have like a choose your own adventure or, you know, get rid of that, you make the body a geographical right. metaphor. <clears throat> yeah. That you would have a lot of different applications you see the overall concepts of which whatever you're teaching is <coughs> whatever you're trying to communicate. And that, that brings it in a conceptual ra level rather than all these little individual bits of information. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's awesome. That would be a really cool idea to do that, like this text-based surgery. Yeah. yeah. I, it's it's yeah. not conventional because you wouldn't no, think that no. that's... What it's I mean, not, but, but think about what, what a master surgeon, when they have their interns, they have them talk through processes. Yeah. So. Uh, does that say it could be other types of diagnostics? Mm -hmm. Like, like um, I was watching And the Band Played On, and they were trying to figure out how HIV was getting transmitted, and you could present, you know, do this interview go do the next interview, yeah. something like that. Yeah, it would be really good for that kind of like a simulation. You know, I often thought, I, I, I mean, I do a, <clears throat> I do a problem-based learning exercise in the course I teach, and it's all laid out for them in a document. Mm -hmm. But you're basically interviewing different people at the company. Mm. That would yeah. be, be cool for something like that. Um, have you ever heard of the game called Quandary by Half-Baked Software? It's the, I think I've heard it's of it. It's an action maze. 
building things. So in the same, it's kind of like a, you know, choose to do this or choose to do that. So it's text-based. So, you know, you could choose to operate on the heart or operate on the, but we used it for like, um, I investigated using it when I worked out at the Justice and Safety Institute, like a day in the life of a caseworker. Okay. So you've got all these cases on your your table, you know, what are you going to do first, you know, okay, so you take this case and then you do, you know, do you choose to contact the administrator or do you choose to push it through the system? So in a sense, it, it is mainly text driven. You know, you could add like little graphics or something just to kind of spice it up. But you know, again, More of a role play as a yeah, you character. know, it's kind of. But again, you're making the choices and you have to map out where you're going. And you know, say you do it wrong, you get kicked back to the beginning, and you have to. So I was just it made me think about that because I would see in science, I would see more of like you know not directional things, but again, like a forensics thing, you know, you know, you're going into, uh, you could use the directions actually in the forensics, like you've come into a house and a crime has occurred, you know, what do you do now? And yeah. move them through that. But then I was also thinking like chemistry or physics, like labs, you know, what are you going to do next? You know, do you add a tablespoon of this and then what happens, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting, you know, some of them have the map dimensions, but then others is just more like a decision process. Yeah. Yeah. And you have up here historical simulation. <clears throat> what popped in my head was well, it's the 100th anniversary. Europe in the evil World War I. You have several different stories. One representing England, one rep representing Austro-Hungary. Austro and each player could only have part of the story and different networks depend and different paths yeah. to choose mm -hmm. depending upon their, you know, what their situation is, what their treaty is, Germ uh, England's alliance with Belgium, and but you know Serbia doesn't know about that, and so they choose their story based on this. You come back to a class report on what you chose in the novel, and then you can work out the situation in Europe and try to understand how well it lines up. That's, that's really cool. Because cool. yeah, yeah. you could actually come in, you would come in as an individual, you'd come up with a mindset of a particular nation. Right. You we could actually start that. debating, you know, yeah. like Germany you, Germany and Poland could debate, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. Well, and yeah. Robbie was mentioning the kind of collaborative element, because that's the tough part is that if these are managed mostly kind of downloadable programs that sometimes can run on the web. It might be tougher to get people in the room, but if you could do something like that, mm -hmm. give people perspectives and then make it a part of a larger project, that's a cool idea. That is a really neat idea. Yeah. Uh, although I think some of them, especially the forensics one, I think just having people play together would be valuable. Mm -hmm. be like, it's a team. Yeah, like, all right, this person wants to go west for us, this person wants to go east for us, what does that all mean? Mm -hmm. And why? Why do you want to go Yeah. So, yeah. Lots of potential. And the nice thing is it's not really resource heavy. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's coming up with the storyline, though, and making sure every you have all the details. It is. And once you have that, you get in, like, like that, that text adventures, you know, from the U.K. thing that I use. It really wasn't that hard. Now, you get into some logic uh, that... Can, if it gets complex because it's laid out visually, it can get the image can get complex. So, um, so how long did it take you say to put together when you did Brent? I'm going to say I spent about eight hours on that, and that was never having used it before, right. which I don't think is bad at all. Uh, you know, now if I were to go in, at least I have some base knowledge about things to do and not to do, and and how to go about it. Um, so, can the editors accommodate? Uh, I guess maybe longer or more descriptive text. So, like, if you wanted to, someone to use a particular, like, eight-word phrase or something like that, can it handle that, or is it going to truncate things down to be I, so many characters? I think it can handle pretty much whatever you can put in in terms of phrases and okay. keywords. Hmm. At least that one could. Now, I don't know about some of the other ones. Uh, and then speaking of foreign language, you could maybe try doing it in Spanish or something. Sure. Yeah, sure. Actually, two other thoughts I had was one, it could be an interesting writing exercise to map out a game. And this may be really off the wall, but one of the interesting things was you're given only text, but yet you have to translate it into a map mm -hmm. at some point. I don't know if there's anything there in that um, where you, you're given linear data, but 
Mm -hmm. Kind of spatial orientation. So yeah. Actually, it could be a screen reader. I could see it mimicking a screen reader. Yeah. Well, we, we, we didn't mention any of that, but but I know some of the stuff that I looked at early on. I had you run it through some accessibility checks, and it seemed to do okay. It's all text. <laughs> yeah, it's all text, so mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about any. Uh, <laughs> if you if you go the pure route, and you don't use any images. You don't have to worry about any kind of. As long as the screen reader is hitting the the right text at the right time, mm -hmm. so the focus is right. So it's, a, it's a great game for you know people with visual impairments, I think. So it looks like we're just about out of time. Anyone online have any? Is there anyone still online? <coughs> just us. Just us? I, I, I can't see the chat room right now. So. Oh, okay. Well, if there's anyone online has anything they want to add, otherwise I think we... Thanks for coming. I think we had a really yeah, nice little talk cool. there. I yeah. wish we could have about five more minutes to talk, but that's okay. So. I'm going to request control, actually. So okay. Can. Let me bounce out here. Go back to do the okay. act and stop sharing my screen. Thanks for doing this, Brett. This is interesting. Yeah, yeah this is fun. Uh, I think... I think we sh always should know where we're coming from so we know where to go. Mm. And all these games that we play nowadays online, they all started from interactive fiction. Mm. Most of them did anyway. So. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hey. All right, thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Brett. Thanks. Thanks for the food, too. <laughs>